Orton going home. For Dave Rosal. first-round game in the NCAA tournament since 1993. What uniqueness this team had in the world that we live in, there's never been a team like this at BYU. Well, I remember having that sense that, wow, you know, special things could be ahead, but uh, it's tough to keep being that good year after year after year. This year was different by far. This, you know, was the funnest. Um, the, the teammates that we had, the kind of chemistry we had on and off the floor, it's something that I'll always remember. I mean, we can remember all the accolades and the spotlight and all the, the awards we had as a team and all the wins and against who and who, how many people are there. I think that all those will remember, but you'll remember the guys you were with and the fun you had and the heartache you had when you lost or something happened. Uh, at the end of the day, I mean, you always remember them and you always will have that special part of your life with them because you know that's where you grew up as not only a person but as a player. You always want to end a story like this as a national champion but it's something that you'll never forget. BYU has suffered seven consecutive first round exits. The Cougars trying to change that against the Florida team back in the tournament for the first time since winning back-to-back -back national titles. I think that the year ago, the basketball tournament, Getting to the second round, it was just such like a monkey off of our back. BYU hadn't won a tournament game since 1993. There was a lot of pressure going into that game against Florida. All the talk was BYU couldn't win in the tournament no matter how good of a regular season they had. Where it was a first round game against a traditionally tough basketball team that had won the national championship. The Cougars were at the point of the brink of being eliminated from the tournament. They were in big trouble. Jackson Emery hits that three late, and then it ends up going to overtime, and then the double overtime, and Jimmer Fredette just taking over the game in the double overtime. To me, that was where it really started. That was, to me, the most unselfish demonstration of basketball as a team that I had ever seen. I can remember coming to the locker room after the double overtime win against Florida and kind of celebrating with the guys and then sitting down with our coaches and just kind of a big sigh of relief and, and, and say, hey, the guys won't ever have to deal with that again. And now we can just move forward from there. I, I think it really gave us a lot of confidence more than anything. I really felt like it was a, a start of good things to come. It was nice to know that we had a successful year that we could build upon. You know, you're on track to be the winningest basketball player in the history of BYU. But you gotta do one thing. What's that? You gotta come back and play. <laughs> it's always a little unnerving when your juniors uh, declare themselves eligible for the draft. If, if Jimmer came back, you know, you had that sense that, you know, they could do even more if that's possible. People were telling me I, I didn't think that they would have, I would have as good of a season this next year um, than I did my my junior year. During those few weeks or months, or, it was it was a time of unsurety, and we were all hoping that he would come back. I honestly thought he would come back. I believed Jimmer believed he could do better if he stayed one more year. I knew in my head, my family knew that if I wanted to come back, if I put my mind to it, we would have a great team. And I knew I could, you know, increase my stock. I knew I was better than, you know, hopefully a late first round pick. Dave said oftentimes that that was my best recruiting effort ever, was to be able to get Jimmer back for a senior year. Well, I think that Jimmer's decision to take his name out of the NBA draft um, I felt really good about because that hour and a half conversation that we had, he was so excited because of his teammates, because of the talent of his teammates, because of the relationship that he has with his teammates. And he was looking forward. The last thing he said to me when he walked out of the office was, this, this will be the greatest year of my life. I can't wait to get started. when he decided to come back, I think there was a lot of uh, 
people that took a deep sigh of relief. But it was great to hear that all, everybody wanted me back, everybody wanted me to stay, and uh, they knew that if I did come back, our team could be very, very good, and I knew that as well, and that's one, the biggest reason why I stayed. Jimmer's coming back, Jackson's back, Kyle's on the team now, me and Brandon are there, and things just seemed like they were gonna play out really well. You know, our goals were to get better over that summer. Personally for me, I looked at the opportunity to play for my country to get some experience to come back and, and help the team. And, you know, everyone kind of just, you know, found different ways they could, they could get better and make our team that much stronger the next year. Winning teams have leaders on the team, out there on the floor, you know, Jimmer, Jackson, Logan. They expected the world from us and they expected the world from each other and of themselves. And they'd go out there and, and work hard day in and day out. And we knew what we wanted to accomplish and we knew how we needed to play to get to that level. The talent, and you know, the hard work and the preparation, those are all really important to being good. But what kind of seals the deal is the chemistry. The team chemistry, I mean, from day one to me was picture perfect. I mean, on and off the court, you know, we knew each other's tendencies on the court and, you know, where they're going to be and kind of what to expect. And, you know, obviously that played to our favor. And even off the court, we had a great time together. And, you know, we, we knew when it was time to be serious and, and to take things um, seriously and, and to not goof around, but you know, I can remember many experiences when <laughs> when goofing around was the key, when you know, relaxing, enjoying the moment was was key to our success and helping us stay focused. I felt going into the season that this could be a really special team because of the experience of the NCAA tournament the year before, the returning guys in our backcourt and then the talent that I felt we had on our roster. Having a guy like Dave Rose as your head coach, um, that, that's really the key, uh, because he's the one that brings in players like Jimmer Fredette and Jackson Emery. He sees the potential in guys that maybe other people didn't see the potential in them. From day one, we all felt like we were gonna win every game that we played in. This team really, um, they played for each other. They trusted each other, uh, but they really respected the hard work that each of them had put in to trying to make the team better. There's no team in America that has one guy and goes all the way. As good as Jimmer was, the complimentary team around him just highlighted his special gifts. They wouldn't have gotten as far as, uh, as they did, and it wouldn't have been nearly as memorable if they didn't have the proper personalities. I think that's what makes them so really uh, a dynamite as a team is the fact that they understand, understand each player's, you know, strengths, their weaknesses, and take advantage of their strengths. But I don't think there's Jimmer mania without Jackson Emery. Now, there's been talent before, no question, with Lee Kamar, Trent Place, and all those guys, and they, they did great things. But with Jimmer and Jackson leading the way, you just have the sense that injuries, whatever, it didn't matter. They were gonna take this team on their backs and, and make them win. We knew we had the pieces. You have a great score in Jimmer coming back, and one of the most solid players we've had here in a long time in Jackson coming back at both as seniors, great leadership, experience, savvy on the court. And then you have a couple young guys that are gonna add and kind of help um, add this intrigue to what it could be. And those guys came through big time this year. Well, the, the schedule was as difficult as any schedule we, we had, you know, kind of put together just because it was hard to get people to come to play. You look at a lot of teams around the country and they don't exactly play difficult schedules to start the season. BYU really challenged themselves. And when Jimmer, re, you know, decided to return, uh, a lot of series that we were talking about kind of didn't happen. And, uh, you know, we, we can all kind of figure for one reason or another why those series kind of fell through. I think they're, you know, in a position where if, you know, if Jimmer left, that maybe they would schedule it. And if the, if Jimmer stayed, then they were going to go in a different direction. BYU went out and they played some tough games on neutral courts. They played tough games on the road. And they really proved to everyone that they could play at, at, a, at a high level. When I first saw that schedule, I thought, wow. I was looking at the teams we're at, and you kind of wonder what what coach does this. We thought if we can get through this, this would be a great opportunity for us to prove to teams that we can play against anyone, anywhere on a national level. Fans loving it at the Marriott Center. 
34-24, BYU by double digits, and Jimmer can extend the lead to a dozen. When you reflect on a great season, there's always a lot of little sub-stories that come to play. Great teams have to win on the road. Being a top 25 team, you almost never leave home in your non-conference schedule. Uh, there's a lot of really good teams that can win at home, and then they have a couple you know, tough losses against good teams on the road. Pretty much you have like one or two games that you'll go and play you know, other teams um, that are not great, or you'll go to a tournament and play some really good teams, whatever it is, but we were on the road for a month straight. Uh, going to South Pottery, we knew we had a, you know, different tasks on our hands, and losing Chris, that meant we were just one more big guy down that we probably needed to guard these big seven-footers that were big guys. That was another another learning point for us. We had to, to learn how to what we we're going to do without him. We went to Glens Falls during that time. We went to Buffalo. We went to Creighton. So it wasn't like they were easy trips. We were going cross country, you know, for a lot of these trips. They were road warriors. I just remember looking at that at that month and wondering, you know, how they were going to get through it. If, if adversity should pop up or, or you know, how would they respond you know, to a loss, if a loss were to come at some point during that trip. We kind of just embraced that whole you know, road warrior saying and you know, everyone felt that way. You just put on your, your blue socks and your, your blue jerseys and you just you know, go to work and battle. If you can win on the road, that's what's gonna determine a good season from a great season. I personally love playing on the road. It's, it's just nice to go into a hostile environment and, and build off that energy. Me and Charlie just talked about this, that the blue jerseys made us feel like we had to prove something. And so we, we love putting on those blue jerseys. First of all, they just look good <laughs> and you like wearing them. You know, like Coach said, you know, you gotta love that jersey because you're gonna be on the road. You know, you're gonna have that animosity from, you know, different crowds and, and everyone. So you gotta use it to your advantage. The blue uniforms gave us some sort of powers that we thought, you know, we had to had to prove to people. We proved to ourselves that, you know, given any environment, we can win. That unselfish nature of the team in South Padre, where everybody had to play, everybody had to contribute to win those games, were defining moments, and I really felt like catapulted the team to the next level. Now to the Cougars, and Brian, we already know that Jackson Emery, while in uniform and may play, but he won't start tonight. I think that Creighton game, when we first had the blue uniforms, really set the tone for us. Jackson didn't practice for like a week coming up to that Creighton game, and going into the game, coach said, you know, Jackson, we might play you a little bit, you might get a little bit of minutes. So Jackson didn't start, and two minutes into the game, Jackson gets subbed in. And I remember him calling me and telling me to check in, and it's one of those things you worry about because you're thinking if I get kicked or if I get hit, you know, I could break my, sh you know, my shin and then I'd really be out for a long time. And then all of a sudden he played the entire game, played 38 minutes. Man, that was one of the gutsiest efforts I've ever seen. And Brandon just came in. Um, and I think that's where Brandon really matured as a, as a player and as a, as a post guy. You know, Brandon, his, uh, his personality um, is really kind of a carefree personality. To me, he always brought the swag to the team. Brandon's a goofball. He's, he's hilarious. Um, you know, he's, he's one of my really good friends. We had a number of guys that uh, had a little bit of comedic value, uh, at least in their own minds. Uh, and certainly, Brandon was one of those guys. One of the nicest people I know. Um, he's just, you know, everyone loves him. He's a wonderful kid. And I think that he's one of the most likable uh, players that I've ever coached. Brandon is the kind of guy that once you get to know him, you'll do anything for him. And all the players felt that same way. You know, he kind of just solidified us last year. You know, his he really got better with every game. You know, Brandon's been through a lot, but um, to see him come through this program and mature as a person, it's it's been a it's been a great experience to see that. post move here. He gives the little fake in here. This is exactly what a big guy will do. He spins, he gives the up fake, and he steps through in an up and under move, a post move by a guard inside the lane. Very nice play. It just seemed like somewhat of a fairy tale ending to Jimmer Fredette's career to have a chance to go back home to play in front of his hometown fans, people that watched him grow up, watched him develop, watched him play as a high school player. 
What could you ask for? Could you ask for anything more? There I was, you know, with, with Albanese assembled media and some from Glens Falls waiting for the hero to arrive. And that was the first, the first glimpse, I think, to that point in the season of, of you know, Jimmermania. I didn't want to play in Glens Falls. I tried to nix that. Uh, generally, our team at BYU basketball try to get a home game for their seniors if there is a kid that comes from somewhere across the country. So trying to get a game for Jimmer back east, there's a number of schools that you can play at, and I was fighting Dave trying to get that game against Syracuse. I thought that would be a blast. But uh, the coach usually knows better than the AD, and he thought that this game in small little Glens Falls would be something special. Glen Falls was exactly what I expected. It, it fit Jimmer just perfectly. Um, just a, a small town, nice people, great place to be in. It was pretty amazing to, to see that how the following that he had, and not only the, that they loved him, but they loved BYU for for being his team. The atmosphere was unreal. 6,000, more than 6,000 people there, standing room only, you know, three deep on the railing. And uh, just to have that standing ovation for, you know, two minutes or something like that before the game started was something that I'll never forget. And, you know, to this day, it gets me emotional. So I really appreciated that. I thought we were just going there to play a game. <laughs> but you know, it was, it was definitely more in the game. We head to Glens Falls and, and we're playing Vermont and they're nine and oh, you know, we've heard a lot about this team, how they're probably a top 25 team. They're gonna be the best team we've played all preseason. And then we're playing the, the sweet dude with the stash. That was just awesome. There was definitely a lot of hype um, going into that game just cause, um, um, just cause given this, the situation. We were all going in there um, with the same mindset. It was just a, another game that we had to win. Another team that was in the way of, of, reaching our, of us reaching our goals. Going into that, people were saying this is gonna be our first real test besides Utah State. You know, can we beat them on the road? They're, it's gonna be practically a home game for Vermont and we're coming over there. One thing, you know, I always remember is going to Civic Center and going inside and feeling how cold it was being in a hockey arena. It was sworn there was just a sheet of ice under us, and there probably was, because it was freezing. It was absolutely cold in that gym. This gym started getting on a roll, as he always did, watching the fans and, and everybody just, you could feel the momentum building and, and their energy. Come out with that with the win, I know it meant a lot for Jimmer and his family, but at the same time, it, it was definitely, it was a, that was a tough team. Vermont's a good team, and we knew that they were going to come in and try to upset us and make it kind of a bad homecoming for Jimmer, so we had to put a lot more work and effort into it than we probably previously anticipated. It's hard to describe, unless you were in the arena, what transpired. and. Uh, for Jimmer, it was magical, but for the team, it was magical. It was captured on national TV. Everybody got to see it, and by then, the, the BYU basketball story was well on its way to becoming what it became. Here's Fredette's first offering. You know, Bobo Jones is right on him. Jimmer doing it just like last year. Downtown, oh, NBA my, range. Oh, my. Double team, he just backed up, said he needed a double team to half court, I'm shooting anyway. BYU comes home from Glens Falls, goes to Energy Solutions Arena, and Arizona comes in, very, very good team, on a roll. Coach Sean Miller does a great job with them over there, and Derek Williams is obviously, he was the number two draft pick in the NBA, and uh, a very talented team, and I knew that they were gonna come in being ready to go. Warren lobs down low for Derek Williams, who throws it down. Early on in the game, Derek Williams goes up, and this pass is thrown way behind him, and he reaches back, grabs the ball, and cocks it throws it down for this huge alley-oop dunk. He does this thing that he always does to, to the opposing fans, and the BYU fans got a little riled by it. We didn't really know what to expect. You know, we went to their place the year before and, and had a, a, a big win, and you know that they were coming with a chip on their shoulder. Ace kicks it to the corner. Perry into the lane, up over Heidsock, out of control. They're letting them play, and now a whistle and a foul. As a Perry will go to the line. Heidsock is banged up. He stays down on the floor. You know, I don't remember a whole lot from that game. I think there's 10 or 9 minutes left in the first half when I got knocked out. And I remember the guy goes up, hits my mouth, comes down, hits me on the top of the head, comes up falling. I think it was Derek Williams' knee or someone hits me as I fall on the ground. He's jumping up. 
And, you know, I'm out from there. I didn't remember a whole lot from the game. They had amazing players and amazing team, but it was someone that Jimmer, I felt like, just had their number. I think he probably averaged close to 40 points in, uh, in the two games that he played against in the last two years. I think after that game, we kind of had a different type of confidence, and we, we started playing a lot more loose and a lot more aggressive. Noah's kind of one of those guys that's just, he's got a different sense of humor. Yeah, I can't, it's hard to explain his type of humor. Well, he always seems to have a one-liner here and there to, uh, sometimes it's really funny, and sometimes it's just so awkward that it becomes funny. He thinks we laugh at the jokes, but we really laugh at him. So unless you know him, you never know if he's being serious or not. He's the goofiest person on the team, hands down. And you know, at first, you know, everyone thought he was really weird. But when you get to know him, <laughs> he's a great person and we love him. You say it was a tough game because that was our first loss. I, I think that loss when it came, um, just re reminded BYU of, 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 of how much, you know, has to go right to, to beat a good basketball team. You know, that was, that was a, a big wake up call for us, you know, cause you can't, the, the biggest problem of having so much success is you can't get comfortable and, and almost like we all were used to winning. Um, we all expected to win. And once we, we hit that game and we came out uh, with the loss, you know, it was a real awakening for all of us that, that we're not the best we can be. It's very hard to come off a loss because you come off a loss and, and you hear things in the media and there's a lot of things um, that you need to improve. A team's never perfect and so in that stretch you have to figure out exactly what you need to do and you need to keep everybody on the same page in that. And you need to keep everybody believing that we're gonna win every game. One of the big parts about having success and keeping it is to be able to maintain composure. I think Dave Rose did a masterful job of keeping the emotions even keeled. One thing you'll never see from Coach Rose is the day after a loss, coming into the, the film room and just blasting players, telling them what they did wrong, showing them on film, he immediately moves on. He not only cares about winning, but he cares about you as an individual and you succeeding in life. And he's just a guy who cares about every player, it doesn't matter if you play 40 minutes a game or you don't play at all or if you're a practice player. The, the pattern I've noticed with, with a Dave Rose team, whether there's a Jimmer and a Jackson or not, he never, rarely ever loses two in a row. You know, puts it in the past, lets us learn from it, and then, you know, quickly prepares us to, to move forward and, and to get back on a winning streak. It's hard for coaches not to get caught up in the fact that you're, rated in the you're ranked in the top 10, that you have sellouts every night, and that you're receiving three or four times the messages, media requests, and opportunities to appear on Jay Leno, who knows? It's just, you, you've got to be able to keep your wits in the midst of a great season. I've been rooming with Charles for the last three years. The, the, the best part about Charles when you get him laughing. Charles has a lot of hidden talents that everyone that everyone doesn't know about but us. He's a fun guy to be with. He likes to argue. He loves to debate, very opinionated, and he, he's very good at it. Even if he knows he's wrong, he'll he'll go down firing. We'll be up sometimes three, four in the morning arguing about something stupid just because we don't wanna we don't wanna let it go. We're both real competitive and both you know just enjoyed it and then after as soon as it was over we were just we were completely fine. And and you see the the clips with him and Lamont with Ronnie, Ron, and Roscoe. What kind of name is Jim? Jim, good name. Sound like candy bar or something. Boy, I'm a little niche running around talking about Jim, Jim, I want Jim, Jim. Get off the Well, my real name is Candy Bar. No, no, no. Yeah, them candy bars back in the day, that's what it is, them two cents. Two cents, now they about two dollars. Inflation. He he loves the cook. Talking with Charles, Charles has always talked about the one thing he wants to do is start his own restaurant. I'd probably eat there, but I'd make him pay me to eat there. We had arranged to have Noah on our Monday night radio coaches show, and Coach Rose and I were talking during a commercial break. And uh, Coach Rose leans over and says, "Hey, you might want to ask Noah about uh, about his car accident." Noah kept it hush hush. I mean, nobody really knew until you know a couple of days later. Yeah, it's right after the UTEP game. It's Christmas time, and we decide, me and my wife, that we're going to drive up to her house in Montana. And so we, we leave right after the game. We're gonna drive there through the whole night. We're gonna surprise her parents. And it's about two in the morning. So I hop and I'm gonna drive. And uh, I'm passing a, 
a semi trailer and uh, going 75. And the roads have been really good up to this point. And then I pass that. And as soon as I go back in the right lane, uh, our car starts to fishtail and turn. And, and so I'm going pretty fast at this point. I'm trying to correct it, but hit a patch of ice and our car starts to roll. And we land in the median. But the good thing is, um, you know, it's there's probably two or three feet of snow right there in the median. So it kind of impacted our landing. And we were all just in awe in the fact that he was sitting there telling us this story. You know, it's kind of a scary thing. You know, my wife, she was kind of half asleep. And so we end up on the side, I'm on the ground. My wife's just hanging from her seat. You know, that's why you gotta buckle up, be safety. When you find out about something like that, your heart just stops. Not only because you're worried about a basketball season, you're just worried about the things of life that can disrupt something that's really good. And I think we sometimes forget that real life is going on for everybody, for the coaches, for the players, and it's not just basketball, and, and things can happen, and so it was great to have Noah back and everything be okay. I would venture to guess that any college coach will tell you that their anxiety level from the time they let their players go for Christmas until they actually get them back and get them in practice, the anxiety level is off the charts. The Mountain West Conference season here on CBS College Sports Network. Steve, could not be a better matchup. What a way to start. I mean, these coaches can't be happy. I'm sure they would rather have come in easy, not a matchup like this. We're moving on to conference play, and the first game, of course, was against UNLV. Uh, we had played UNLV on their home floor eight times during Coach Rose's tenure, and we were 0-8. And as much as you don't want to bring it up, you don't really have to, because everyone knows that's kind of the unspoken story here about how tough it's been for BYU, even in its best years, to get a win down there against UNLV. It's, it's just super frustrating, because you're just thinking, how do we beat you here? Why do you guys play so well? And how can we even just play good? And you still just humiliate us. There was a sense of urgency, and I, there, there was a sense of urgency all season, but I think it escalated, because that was right at the beginning of league play. Um, and the guys knew that it was now or never, let's, let's make a run. So I actually thought, you know, this would be a good time to go in there and play them. Uh, it was a great time for us, as it turned out. I think we were 14-1 and one, uh, from our preseason. We had won the majority of our games away from the Marriott Center. We didn't depend on the home court for our team to be good. Uh, the players had a lot of confidence and they had a lot of desire. Not only did the players want it, but we wanted it for Coach Rose more than anything. And we wanted to win, not just for our team, but for a coach. I think it kind of reflected on um, the year before, just not being able to get past that, that first NCAA tournament game. And um, when we learned from that, we, we kind of applied that to this season and, and used that as, as fuel for this game. I actually heard different times our players talking about that in the locker room, in our preparation. And uh, that, you know, this was going to be the time. And I think Jax was a huge part of believing that we could do this and then getting the rest of the guys to believe that they could do it. They knew that this was one of the things that they were going to have to overcome. We had to beat Las Vegas on their court for this season to be a success. That UNLV game was always going to be the game that everyone looked at you know, with the question mark. And the question was, are these guys for real? As soon as we got on the plane, we just wanted to play the game. Um, it felt like the longest night ever. Um, but, you know, we had a really good feeling about it. Going into the Thomas and Mac, a really familiar place. We played there a ton. You know, the smell of the place, you know, the feel of the place. We got there. The crowd was crazy as can be. Again, as always, uh, they had be they had like Jim or Who shirts on. Their fans were nuts. Absolutely nuts. I mean, it was definitely one of the more hostile environments we ever played in. Well, everybody was just going crazy, and they always sell the place out against us for some reason. They just don't like BYU. I think they kind of try to intimidate us with their fireworks and all that jazz. Going into this game, there's, I know Jim was thinking the same thing, where it was like, this is our senior year. We've never done this. Coach Rose never done this. This year, we went in there and whole different mindset, um, whole different expectations for our team. We put in a very different game plan. Jimmer for Denton, his teammates have never won a game here. As Jackson Emery, the senior guard, drills a three. We knew what to expect. We knew that UNLV likes to play on runs. And when they get a run, you know, a lot of times what you do is you fold because you think, oh, like, at least we gave it our best shot. The team that is home usually is able to put their will. When the Rebels go on one of their runs, 
and that crowd gets loud, usually the, what happens next is, you know, it goes from bad to worse. 11 straight for UNLV. And they came out strong again, just like they always do. Got up for about 10 points, 10, 11 points right in the beginning. And I was like, nah, this is not happening again. We, we got down, I think, 9 or 10 in the first half. But Jackson Emery. Must be a contact dislodged. I don't see a, a cut at all. As the delay prolonged, the fans began to give Jackson and BYU a hard time for the delay. Jimmer basically just said, be quiet and drilled about three or four deep threes. The first play that stands out to me was Brandon's put back dunk. For that again, Davies! And all of a sudden, before you know it, you look up, the game's tied. And how about this? BYU has stormed back to take the lead. They're right here, his players had to space the floor. For that, hits another one. And then he and Jackson just took over the game. Fredette, Fredette! And Emery makes a pay. You got Jimmer who's on majority of the time and then Jackson if he's got his his shot going and his defense and him in the passing lanes, it's, it's someone that it's, it's near impossible to, to stop. This is turning into a blowout. Uh, they just kept, you know, attacking him. You know, he just didn't have an answer for him. And we, we were playing out of our minds. We were playing well. Everything was going in. It seemed like that basket was just getting bigger and bigger. Baseline put back. Logan Magnuson. Yeah, if you were to not have told me the stats, I probably would have said Jackson had around 40 and Jimmer had around 60. Oh, for that! How deep was that? That was almost at the end of the V of UNLV. We got up 20 points and uh, everybody didn't, no one knew what to do. Everybody was leaving early. It was dead silent in there. I was screaming, going nuts, and everybody was as well, and it was the best feeling in the world. There was a Las Vegas rider who compared you two to uh, Batman and Robin, uh, the Green Hornet, Kato. You got a favorite sidekick? I, I don't, but I, I would consider myself Batman in this. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, don't, I don't think Jimmer would agree, but. <laughs> He claimed he was Batman, although he wasn't sure you were going to agree. No, I'll give it to him. I'll give it to him for right now, but, you know, you know, maybe tomorrow. We'll see. We'll see how I feel. Jackson and Jimmer, I could see Jerry and George for Seinfeld. Uh, George would be Jimmer. Well, Jackson's a great guy. Jackson is... Uh, one of my, my best friends on the floor, we compliment each other very, very well. How he can, you know, hit the spot up jumper, so, and he knows where I'm, where I'm gonna drive at. Jim's, uh, when you take him on the floor, he's not much of a floor general as far as getting guys' faces or talking to them, but uh, I think that's what made a great combination. Our leadership is I'm more of the, the yeller getting guys' faces, and Jim's more just the, the leader by example. I think we could all, play or coach for a long time and it would be really hard to find a guy that is more committed to winning, that is more competitive than Jackson Emery. If you, you're going into a battle or you're going into something where you have to win, you have to get something achieved, something done, Jackson's the guy I want with me. Hardest working guy in practice, uh, played through all kinds of injuries. And He's been a great example to me, um, you know, even more as a person but obviously as a basketball player also. The, the most interesting, interesting thing about Jackson is that he can get guys around him to believe whatever Jackson believes. And uh, that's a great quality. He was kind of the father figure of the team. You know, he was in a lot of ways the heart and soul of that team for the last few years. And his character and integrity um, and intensity uh, brought a lot to the crowd and to that program. When you have a good team, it's kind of, you have to choose your poison, I felt like. And that's why Jim and I were such good compliments, is we, we knew each other's style of play. If I drive, he knows where to be, and I know where he's going to be, so I can always hit him for those threes. It's easy to overlook pieces of the puzzle, and every team has pieces that are needed to become a good team and to make every player good. I don't know if I've seen a team that had been like that. Maybe you look at Jordan, who gets everything, and then you got Scottie Pippen, who sacrificed for Jordan to be so great. This is what's different. This is college basketball. These are young guys that want to achieve because they only got one chance. Jackson could have probably averaged 18 to 20 points a game without Jimmer. But with Jimmer on that court, he knew that he had a role to play and he put his ego on the shelf. 
and sacrificed so that Jimmer could have a great season. The great part about it is Jimmer realized that. I, I love the fact that all the guys on the team contributed their piece. Rarely has a rivalry game brought the Utes and Cougars together with the teams headed in such different directions. BYU, of course, ranked 10th, hunting a seventh straight win, while the Utes are trying to avoid a seventh straight loss. And you know, that prestigious program hasn't lost seven in a row in 61 years. Steal number 196, a record surpassing the previous total set by Danny Ainge. Jimmer for three, top of the key. Timeout to Utah. Jimmer for that double figure scoring for a 23rd consecutive game. It's always tough to play up there, you know, just because it's a rivalry game and they're always up for it, and you never know what you're gonna get out of that team. It's gonna be a fun game. Anytime you play Utah, it's a fun game. Throughout the entire preseason, you're coaching your team and you're you know doing the very best you can to give your team everything, every chance they have to win but you've kind of got one eye on your rival. Once we got there, there was a smell in the in the locker room that just, that it reeked and it just, I think that set off, that set off the coaches, that set off everyone even more than we were already set off just for, just for it being versus Utah. I was sure it was gonna be packed. You know, and everybody on the team thought it was gonna be packed. We all thought we were gonna come in and, and face a, a crazy Utah crowd. It was a great atmosphere, and you know the BYU fans there were going crazy and really took over that arena, to be honest with you. And then when you break down the numbers, you realize that it was much closer to 50-50. You know, Jackson you know, had a special night by getting the steals record. For Jackson to get you know, that steal and to, to get it uh, you know, at the University of Utah uh, against his rival team. Jackson Emery is the one that gets the game ball because he had broke the all-time steals record, and he did all the little things that helped make the team great. He's worked hard to be such a good defender because he pushes himself all the time in whatever it is. And I thought that was very uh, you know, classy of Utah to do. It was something that meant a lot to me and that I worked so hard for. I thought that was pretty special for, for both of those guys to have you know, record-setting nights. You see players that get in the zone sometimes, but I don't know if I've ever seen a guy that knows whatever he throws up, is gonna hit. When you saw the kinds of shots he was hitting from where he was making in the first half, they're all going in, and you see the numbers, now he's at 15, now he's at 20, now he's at 25, and, and not even halftime yet. You could throw it up there, and it was just going in regardless of where I threw it up from, who was guarding me, you know, it didn't matter. I mean, I felt bad for Utah at that point. I mean, what are you, what are you supposed to do? There was about four seconds left, I think, when they inbounded the ball just before the half. And I turned to a security guard and I said, no matter where Jimmer is on the floor, if he gets the ball with time left, whatever he throws up, wherever it's gonna be, it's gonna go in, you watch. And all I can hear in my headset is the crowd chanting, Jimmer, Jimmer, Jimmer. He was just dribbling it up to the sideline, kind of gave the kid a little hesitation, a little in and out dribble, got him off balance, took one, two steps, just threw it up there right at half court. But he decided just to shoot it from there, uh, which is a total Jimmer move. When he he pulled up for that shot. He knew the spot where he was going to, and when he pulled up, you know, it just looked, it just looked so effortless. Jimmer from 40 feet, got it! He got it! Maybe the greatest half of basketball ever. I would have been surprised if it didn't go in, just the way things were going for him that night. By the end of the game, uh, the Utah fans were cheering for Jimmer. They set down their red flag or whatever it is they're holding, and they clap for Jimmer for that. I couldn't believe it. I was looking up and around, and and I couldn't believe what I was hearing. They can't hate, hate this kid, and they can't hate this team. I remember talking to a GM, NBA GM, after the game, and, and he couldn't believe what had happened. And he said, you know, they said this kid's good, but my goodness, why don't you tell me? New phrase in college basketball, jimmered. Last season, TCU and Arizona, yeah, they got jimmered. Fredette hung 45 and 49 on them last week. UNLV, 39, they got jimmered. Tonight, his last game in the Huntsman, Fredette jimmered the Utes. It means going off on your opponent with impunity. The Utah game is when Jimmer mania began. And when you hit a half court shot like that, and having Greg Rubel call it, and it's replayed hundreds of times, thousands of times all over the place, um, that's really what I think got the momentum going. Well, that's the game that got the whole nation's intention, if you will. Good afternoon, Jimmer Fredette. Jimmer Fredette. Jimmer Fredette. Jimmer Fredette. Jimmer Fredette has become a big time college basketball star. He scores from just about everywhere on the floor. Unbelievable. Best score, uh, obviously, in the country. You just got Jimmered. Jimmer Mania got hot because of ESPN. 
and ESPN cover, you know, when they cover Jimmer, they got, it's like Jimmer's the, the name and being from New York and, and ESPN, if you're from the tri-state area or Boston, you, ESPN loves you. I was getting hit up by ESPN, uh, like three different ESPN stations, and I was getting hit up by just tons of people. The next day I was talking to First Take, you know, I was on the Jim Rome show, I was on Pardon the Interruption, I was on, you know, all these different shows just because of this one game. It was the springboard to, to Jim Romania, that game, and he got the recognition of not only Utah and then, you know, the BYU fans, but then also NBA players were tweeting about him and talking about him on radio shows. I gave him a little round of applause when they when they gave uh, when they introduced him. I think he's a really good player. He can flat out score the basketball. Uh, he's pretty much can shoot it as soon as he steps in the building. I'm in his corner all the way. I want to see him be the best guard in the country, and I think he is. His distances uh, of shots taken and made became a staple of how ESPN would would describe shots made in other games. You know, I remember distinctly watching NBA highlights. On, on SportsCenter and seeing ESPN bring in the Jimmer range graphic for the shots the pros were taking now. You know, for us it was kind of surreal because anywhere you go, you know, you type in J-I on Google and then it'll try to, <laughs> it'll say Jimmer, you know, it thinks that's what you're trying to spell. You know, that's how popular he got. You know, everywhere we went, people would ask us about him. You know, you can, you go to eat, someone asks you about Jimmer, you go to, the class will ask you about him, your professor will ask you about him. You get a call from one of your buddies from France, they'll ask you about him. Then your mom calls you to see how your day was and then she'll ask you about him. And even at practice sometimes people would be out there waiting at the main entrance so I'd have to slip out the back and try to, you know, leave just because I had to go places via class or whatever it is. Uncle Mo, as they said, arrived, baby, in Provo. Uncle Mo came aboard, momentum, and there's nothing like momentum. It created a frenetic frenzy, a jimmer frenzy. It's the hottest ticket in town, and these students know it. Thousands of BYU students are lining up already, more than three hours ahead of game time. After a few games in the Mountain West Conference, it was going to be plain to see that the conference was really loaded with basketball this year. There were going to be some big time games at home and on the road. And the one that I think people started looking at after we beat UNLV was San Diego State. Uh, BYU is one of the best running teams in America. And in the RPI rankings today, BYU is number one in the country. In San Diego State, number four. Mountain West Conference, number, number four. four. Ahead of three BCS leagues. We knew it was going to be a tough game, but at the same time we were super excited because it was at the Marriott Center. We knew the game had been sold out for weeks. The anticipation of our students, that was one of the first times where you could see our students were going to be fully invested in this season. You know, students camped out and lined up for hours. I saw the kids camping out, and the tents lining the Marriott Center all the way around. And, and when you we get there like an hour and a half, two hours before game time, and, and to see all the students already packed in there. When you play on the road in a place like this, the danger zone is very small. Trying to get in that arena was nearly impossible and the NBA scouts alone that night between general managers and NBA scouts, there were 30 in the crowd. We didn't have enough seats for the NBA scouts. We were moving people. Once um, that ball tipped off, everyone was, it was just a, a free for all, I guess. Burnett has Tapley on him. 20 points in the first half. He's putting on a show here. Jimmer would say, we played this exact same team last year and we beat them. And we played this team the year before and we beat them. And I don't care what they're ranked this year, we're gonna beat them again. Everybody that plays against Fredette tells you, if you relax for a second, he could be 30 feet, he'll just pull up and hit it on. He could flat out shoot the ball anywhere. He's a threat as soon as he touches the basketball. He's a threat the moment he got off the bus, man. Are you kidding me? A deep one over tap. What are you supposed He's, to do with that? It is in, you see it all the time. You see all the highlights, and then you sit here and see it in person, and your jaw drops. What are you supposed to do with that? Off the court, Jimmer is the nicest kid you'll ever meet, the most humble kid you'll ever meet. When he's on the court, he's an assassin. 39 for Fredette. Another 40-point game. Remember, it's just the second time 
if he's ever scored 30 or more here. 13 of them on the road. I'll tell you, that road statistic may be the most incredible statistic of Jimmer Fredette. When you saw that uh, competitiveness, that he, the, the primal scream he let out. I think every game that goes on, this kid's making a stronger and stronger case for himself to be the national player of the year. And Jimmer Fredette and BYU winning this showdown. After that we won, it was just amazing, a great feeling that, you know, we can beat a really good team. We did it here on this home court, and then the fans rushed the court. I can remember one kid coming out of the stands, face just beat red, just screaming, and just sprinting right towards us. And I just, I ducked and covered. I just shook hands and got out of there as quick as I can before we all got mobbed. It was a, a crazy, crazy atmosphere, and I was just glad that we were able to come out with a win because you know, people were expecting it from us. The NBA scouts and general managers were saying things after the game to me like, that was the most incredible college basketball atmosphere I've ever been a part of. One of the most incredible performances I've ever seen. I'm just so glad they were even in the arena. After this, this San Diego State game, that's just really when Jimmer Mania, I think, was at its, at its peak. I think it got white hot a number of times because Jimmer hype, Jimmer answers. Hype, Jimmer answers. That's unusual, not only for BYU, but just sports in general. I could write a, a regular column on some subject, and a good day would be 17 to 22,000 page views. When you wrote something about Jimmer Fredette, the page views would be around 80,000, maybe 100,000. You know how the Twitter works? Yeah, I do, I okay. do. <laughs> okay, well this Twitter just came up tonight from Kevin Durant. Okay, well he says, Jimmer Fredette is the best scorer in the world, exclamation point. He has you play pickup games we've read with some inmates at a local prison. We had everything from people sending in poetry to ballads. It got crazy. And then you got the Jimmer, you got Jimmered, and then the fans, and... Arriving home at 1 and 2 in the morning and having 500, 600, 700 people at the pro airport. I wasn't ready for it, to be honest with you. It hit me like a hurricane. Once we got off the plane, got our bags, got inside, uh, we would have decoys. We would have players that acted as decoys. Uh, that would go in certain areas so that people would rush to, and then we would duck Jimmer in a jacket out the side door in a car. Radio stations uh, calling from all over saying, hey, you know, this is so-and-so from ESPN Omaha. Love to have mom for five minutes. You know, 20 times five is 100 minutes. 30 times, you know, you just, how many radio stations can I do for five minutes? There was a, a BYU student named Michelle Peralta who posted the opinion that the Jimmer phenomenon and the devotion for his talents was approaching um, idol worship. And she wanted to state uh, for the record and publicly that she would, didn't, didn't favor that kind of treatment of Jimmer Fredette, that there were more important things to do, tests to take and, and grades to earn, and, and it's just a basketball game. And this touched a nerve with Jimmer Nation. And they, in their own way, um, let Michelle know that they disagreed with her. Sometimes it was tough though. You wanted to go and just kind of hang out and be yourself, but you know, people still wanted to come up and have autographs and pictures and you know, you always have to, you know, be grateful for that because it's not always going to be there. There were times when we would try to get him on the bus, try to get him, slip him away, and he would say, no, I need to sign all these autographs for these kids. That's the part where you just realize that you're dealing with one of the most unique, special, players, not only of all time, but people. And Jimmer and I lived together in the, in the dorms. Um, he was just a, a Helaman Hall's kid. You meet him in person and you just go, huh, that's the guy, huh? Seems so, you know, kind of average and normal. And we, we gave him a hard time just because he was too humble sometimes, you know? He's just our friend, like he's our brother on the team. We talk to him as if he, like he's, he's part of our family. He's a little boring, you know, he, <laughs> He just like, he watches TV and you know, he likes to go to movies and eat and stuff, but you know, that's about it. I mean, when he's not with his family or, you know, or friends, I was, that's all he does really, besides, you know, working on his game. I think everyone, all the players, you know, they really enjoyed it. They enjoyed the fact that people were paying attention to our team and uh, the sellout crowds at the Marriott Center and the students camping out for two or three days to try to get into the games. 
I think as a player, that makes you feel really good that, you know, what you do and how much work you put into it that people are actually paying attention to you. Coach Rose mentioned it one time and he said, you guys need to enjoy this experience while you can because, you know, it's your success that's getting you to this point. And so just enjoy it. And people after practice wanted to stand in line and see if they could get Jimmer's autograph and get the, 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 the whole team, the players' autographs. And Turn on ESPN and they're talking about Jimmer and Jimmer and Jimmer and Jimmer shots and this and that. And, and then at the same time, you know, you realize, you know, I'm playing with Jimmer. I'm on the same floor with Jimmer. Like, this, this is about Jimmer, but I'm right there with him, too. I just passed him the ball. You know, BYU's on a national spotlight. I think it was awesome just to, for BYU and the basketball program and, and the university as a whole to get that much attention. Well, I thought that, you know, the expectations kept building and building because they kept winning and winning and winning as many games they did. And certainly the Jimmer show, getting all kinds of headlines, putting in 40, 45. How often? Do you play in a basketball season where every single night you know you're going to be on ESPN, you know you're going to be part of something great, and you're contributing to one of the best college basketball teams in the country? And as you can understand, after what happened Wednesday night in particular, things have just gone off the hook in Provo. Everybody's phones burning up, all kinds of requests. And uh, the scene after the game Wednesday night was, I I've really rarely ever seen anything like it. It was literally as if Jimmer Fredette was a rock star who had just finished a concert. People just wanted to touch him, to, to come close to him. Well, and he gets that all over the place. Even coming off the bus today, we noticed that New Mexico folks asking for yeah. autographs, recognizing the great scorer. Bob Staffen, Kevin Brill, and Sean Lehigh are the officiating a trio today. We had a great season going, and most of the time, I would think sooner or later we're gonna lose. Emery looking to run. Nice feed, boy. Hearts up. Oh, Drew Gordon with an outstanding play from behind. They go to New Mexico, and you know we really felt good about how we're playing. Um, you know we're up at halftime. We're up by 10 or 12 in the second half, and you know feeling okay, we're gonna get this win. We're, we're that team. Cougars up seven point lead. You know, that 30 minute mark hit, and I don't know, it was just a different team, a different feeling. Well, this place ready to explode yeah. on. You could just tell, just right on the edge of their seats. Well, nobody's in their seats. Everybody's standing, including you and I, to be able to see in this building. And we let New Mexico kind of have that feel of, you know, this, this like a wounded animal. There's a lead. Tony Snell. Just what New Mexico wanted. They've given themselves a shot here in the final five minutes. Back from 13 down. We got out of sync a little bit. I could see that on the court because we were switching between man and zone. And, and you know, sometimes we got the call, sometimes we didn't. And we were just out of sync. BYU really surviving on those second and third chances. Sometimes when you're doing something really well, you have to take a step back, kind of rest, you know, let your mind settle and go back into things. So now New Mexico can really seize advantage here, up six with the ball. And they want to make BYU work defensively and use some clock here. Gary Turn to kick to Snell. Tony Snell has made three. It was a tough game, but that's kind of what you expect. You're going to have to battle through these dog day afternoons of the end of the season where games are going to be tough. An amazing second half turn. UNLV coming in 17 and 5 on the NCAA bubble a bit. An upset win in Provo would be a massive boost to the Rebels' pretty solid national profile. Cougars are in great shape to start the second half of conference play. 7 and 1 in league, led by the conference's presumptive player of the year and likely national player of the year, Jimmer Fredette. Last time he faced UNLV, he scored 39. And that was after UNLV's Trayvon Willis called Jimmer supposedly the best player in the Mountain West Conference. Well, Willis is talking about Jimmer again, we hear saying he hopes that he guards him as much as possible today. I think that the night before in our team meeting in the hotel, I think it came up. One of the other players, you know, said something. So Willis opens the scoring and then guards Jimmer Fredette as he takes the inbound trigger from Collinsworth. So full court defense from Trey on Jimmer Fredette. If you put a challenge in Jimmer Fredette's way, he's going to meet it. Jimmer to the strikes. Trayvon Willis looks a little incredulous. Jimmer will engage you if, you know, if the business of winning the game has been taken care of. If, if, if the W's in the bag 
and you still want to challenge him one-on-one, -on -one, he'll play that. There's always going to be someone talking. There's always going to be someone who, who doesn't like you. You know, Jimmer's a competitor, and it doesn't matter what you say, he's, he's still going to come out and, and play his hardest. The Jimmer Fredette, that's everybody's All-American and, and, and just, the, you know, the nicest guy in the world, uh, becomes, you know, the most cold-blooded assassin when he wants to be. And, and, you know, Trayvon Willis found that out firsthand. Leads it, Jimmer top of the key. Jimmer 19 points, 6.55 to play. Jimmer stops and pops from three. Yes! Jimmer! You know, I, I, was, I was really proud of Jimmer because I think that Jimmer handled it really well in the media. Uh, you know, and then he just went out and, you know, did what he does. Jimmer, Trayvon had some more stuff to say about you before the game. Did you use that as motivation, or did that even reach you, what he said? I didn't even hear what he said, to be honest with you. Um, and to this point, it doesn't matter. I don't, I don't really care, um, you know, what he says. Um, you know, I was just worried about our team and going out there and getting a victory. And uh, that's what we did. We did it twice this year so far. And, uh, you know, that's all we were worried about. And uh, we were able to play well and get a, get a good victory. And, you know, it doesn't, doesn't matter at this point. We really believed that we could go down there and win. But as the week went on, everybody's interviews, it didn't matter who, if it was local media, national media, San Diego media, the questions that they were asking all of us, coach, staff, players, was as if the game had already been played and we had already been beat. Everyone expected them to win. I don't remember very many people picking us to win at San Diego. You walk into the gym to start shooting uh, about an hour and 10 minutes before the game, and it's completely packed. Two minutes before the game, and they're yelling at you, and they're pumped, and dressed up as missionaries, and mocking us. You know, they're doing their dunk show, and they're trying to intimidate you and pump up the fans, and it was just a fun atmosphere, probably the funnest I've ever played in. And it was on national TV, and you got a sense that if we're really going to be any good, we got to win these games. You hear that San Diego State game's going to be nationally televised, and people are going to see it all around the world. And it didn't really hit me until we got to the shoot around, and you see, like, Steve Kerr and Clark Kellogg, they're ready to announce the game, and you're like, whoa, this game must be pretty big time. I think San Diego State came into the game with a lot of confidence, thinking for sure that now that it's in San Diego and not in Provo, they were, they were going to win this game. Leonard in the corner, there's the fadeaway. Oh, pretty good. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. That, he's on candy. My goodness. Nice pass. Carl, the hook who's there for the football. Everybody <laughs> played a superb game. Jimmer had a very complete game, yet it was the assist number that jumped out to me that he had to get nine assists. This was the game where a couple of the role players had big games. Everybody, Charles went off. Uh, everybody played just the way they were supposed to play. San Diego straight tried to double Jimmer, and so Jimmer made extra passes and got other guys involved. It was who was on the receiving end of those passes. They were making big shot after big shot after big shot. It's Noah Hartsock one time down. It's Steven Rogers the next time down. And Charles Abuo again and again and again from three. And Charles came in and played like a man. He really shot the ball extremely well that game. Every time I hit him with an open pass, he was knocking it down, and everybody was. The coaches just told me to stay spaced, and I was fortunate enough to make those shots. Jimmer dribbles the ball across half court, and Billy White, for a split second, looks over at the bench to try to tell him to bring him out of the game. When he looks back, Jimmer's already shot it. It had to have been from 35 feet. He's already shot the ball. It goes in and the bench from San Diego State just erupts. They are screaming at Billy White, don't take your eyes off him. He's yelling, what am I supposed to do? He's 35 feet away from the basket. Not only were they good enough to, to beat Arizona the way they did, not only good enough to beat UNLV in Las Vegas, they are good enough to beat San Diego State twi twice in the regular season with them sitting in the top 10. What can't this team do? We begin today with Brigham Young University. On the verge of getting its first number one seed ever, the school announced today that it has suspended forward Brandon Davies. Brandon Davies. Brandon Davies. Brandon Davies. They suspended their starting for Brandon Davies for the remainder of the season after they violated the school's honor code. Go to BYU's hopes of making a deep run in the NCAA tournament. The number three Cougars dismissing starting forward Brandon Davies from the team for the remainder of the season, citing a violation of the school's honor code. 
the team's third leading scorer, dismissed for the rest of the season. How big a blow is this for the Cougars? I think it really hurts. I think any time you're going you're gonna to be successful in the NCAA tournament, you've got to be able to score in the post and guard in the post. You talk about chemistry. You talk about rhythm. You talk about a guy that is valuable, averaging 11 points a game. He rebounds. He gives them plus minutes defensively. You take that out of your lineup, it's got to hurt. I think it's a huge blow to BYU and their chances in the NCAA tournament. Losing a play like Davey, very, very important at this time of the year. Tom Izzo has said this for years. You know, players play and tough players win. Yeah. And uh, we'll find out how tough BYU is going forward. It was it was a sad day. And the thing that made it probably the most sad was the fact, not the fact that he couldn't play, but how much it just hurt everyone, including him. I'll never forget that day in the locker room. It was actually in, in the film room. We were sitting there and the captains left. Um, it's just really weird. There's that weird feeling in the air. And well, coach took Brandon out for a little while before we started filming. Next thing I know, one by one, the captains kind of roll back in. Coach comes in, Brandon comes in, and I always sat right in front of Jackson. And Jackson kind of grabbed me and he was like, just kind of gave me the look and then looked at Brandon and instantly I knew something was up. He trusts people um, the way we trusted each other. It's just that's something you don't that you don't have someone else tell them that you should feel comfortable with telling your telling your your family basically. Coach told us, Brandon told us, and I mean, there was tears. Everyone was crying. It was sad. You know, it, it really hurt when when it came out. We were all devastated. Um, you know, this kid has worked so hard uh, with us this whole entire time we've been here this last season. Losing Brandon was very hard for us. Um, very emotional. One thing for someone to to get hurt and to be off the team, or not off the team, but just not be able to play. And there's another thing when, you know, someone's healthy, he's able to play, he's playing really, really well, but he can't. Yeah, I didn't really, I wasn't too worried about our team. I wasn't worried about what was gonna happen to the team chemistry or anything like that. I was just worried about what was gonna be happening to be because, you know, that's where my, my focus was. I wanted him to continue to be with us, continue to know that we love him and that we wanted him there with us and that everything's gonna be all right. As hard as it was to go through, I think in the end it'll be, people will talk more about the redemption than the fall, which is usually what happens if people stick with things. the 30th game of the year and the first game without Brandon Davies as part of the team. I think you have to remember two things with that New Mexico game is that our matchup against New Mexico is very difficult. Even without Brandon Davies, you've got to get post touches. There's no, no big men at all inside the arc for BYU. You've got to be able to suck that defensive in at least get a touchdown low. We all wanted to, to tell ourselves and, and to think that, you know, we, we can still come away with the win. We all kind of thought we were just going to go fix it and fix more than just the game. We're going to fix the whole situation. And it didn't work very well. And this is New Mexico is a great team. You know, they'd beaten us with Brandon previously. And, you know, it, was, it wasn't going to be a walk in the park. And I think their morale and confidence was definitely boosted knowing Brandon wasn't going to be playing. I can only imagine that, that they played that night um, the way that I kind of felt. Hey man, here's Fredette. Fredette throws up a prayer that goes over the backboard. He's, wow, it's just the, maybe the worst shot we've ever seen Jimmer take. I think, you know, it just it just wasn't our night. Um, you know, you have some of those games in your basketball career, and I think that was just one of them. And, and I think it's also, you know, symbolic that, that they struggled, you know, mightily uh, without Brandon Davies against New Mexico, but also without him physically as well. He wasn't with them that night. After a loss, you have a tendency to start feeling sorry for yourself. And then when you add that to some things that were out of your control, you don't really know where all your players are going to go individually. 82 to 64. BYU has its toughest scoring and shooting night of the season here at home, and the Lobos win it. Triple zeros on the clock. Lobos 82, BYU 64. Go ahead with questions. Jimmer, do you think tonight was about X's and O's? It was kind of an emotional hangover after the last 24 hours. And just it was everything, I think. We just didn't play well. They shot the ball really well. They played, you know, very, very good tonight. And they knew that they had a big game. And uh, they came in and shot the ball well. And we didn't play great. What a great opportunity we had to do something really special in 
the uh, in a time that was more difficult than any time that we had been through. BYU never led the entire game versus New Mexico. Lobos got out to a 6-0 start and a 13-2 lead. Wyoming scores on its first shot of the game. When we got blasted against New Mexico and started off really poorly against Wyoming. He's picked, regains, sends low, and now it's another turnover. You wondered if we were ever going to get it back together. Cruz, Paco dribbles in from 15. He leans in and scores. Cruz makes it 6-3, to three, Wyoming. We come out against Wyoming still a little bit, uh, you know, kind of maybe stunned from the game, the game before. Uh, the first half, Wyoming played terrific. It was a battle back and forth. Dalen Harrison ties the game at 35. Jimmer takes Dalen Harrison to the front. They meet him at the timeline. Jimmer skips past the double. Kick in the corner, Jax will fake a three, step back, take it and make it! There it is! That's how the half's gonna end! Cougars by three at halftime! That second half we came out and uh, we played. Charles posting up and hard to the hole for two! Crossing it over, taking him down the lane, floater, scoop and score. Jimmer for that! Screen, low from Jimmer to Magnuson, handoff, Kyle throw down! And by fumbles, regain, no, he lost it! Jackson on the steal, Jackson breaks away and throws it down! Scored a long time. Bounce to Abuwa, reverse and score 100 points. Charles Abuwa was uh, terrific in the second half. And Jackson and Jimmer and Logan had wonderful senior days uh, to finish their career here at the Marriott Center, and uh, we were able to celebrate. It was a great feeling. We were able to beat them pretty good. Everybody was there cheering for us. And then the best part is when you get to go, you know, take down the nets. And uh, everybody got a pretty big cheer, but Brandon, when he went up there, it was the loudest cheer of the night by far. Especially through all the adversity we had been through, through losing Brandon and losing Chris earlier on in the season and the injuries we had and the, the losses and the wins and the traveling and through everything we went through this season, and just being a part of all of it, to still get that Mountain West Conference Championship made it that much sweeter and that much more enjoyable. With all it accomplished forever, that banner that says 2011 regular season conference champs will hang in the Marriott Center forever. You realize all the things we planned for are still there. It didn't matter that we lost to New Mexico. It really didn't matter that Brandon wasn't there. We had taken a different path, but we could still accomplish a lot. TCU doesn't have a ton of size in their front court or a lot of depth, so this is actually a good first round matchup for BYU in terms of depth in the front court. These two teams met twice during the regular season, BYU winning 83-67 on January 18th and winning 79-56 on February 19th. We've got 20 minutes on the clock at the Thomas and Mack, and here we go. For that on the wing right side, crossover, penetration, handoff to Charles, reverse and score! Front court. Hand off Jimmer. Jimmer, no look Kyle. Kyle drives, hangs, and hits! Off the Fredet assist. Cougars by six, ten in a row for BYU. The three on two. Jimmer ahead to Kyle. Touch pass Jackson, lays it up and in. Cougars running it. Emory, Emory backdoor. Jimmer lost his man, lays it up and in. A dozen for Jimmer Fredette. The basket by Jimmer Fredette breaks the single season scoring record at BYU held by Devin Durant. Jimmer now with 867 points this season. Remarkable. We played against TCU the night before, and everyone thought we were going to win that game, and we did. And then the next game against New Mexico, no one thought we were going to win that game. And I think the biggest reason is because we lost six straight to them. BYU wearing the whites as the co-regular season champions and the number one seed by virtue of their season sweep of San Diego State. But New Mexico won both regular season games, and that's what makes this matchup delicious. I talked a little bit about it with Jimmer, and going into the game, we had to win. We just said we had to win. Everyone thought that, you know, they're like, oh man, we gotta play New Mexico again. And I was like, yeah, we're playing New Mexico again. I can't wait. Frustration that BYU had had against New Mexico the previous season getting swept, and then this season getting swept in the regular season. You got a sense that Jimmer wasn't gonna let it happen again. I don't care what I have to do. I don't care what our team has to do. I'm not losing these games in New Mexico again. From the very tip, you could tell that our guys were really dialed in. And, you know, we scored the ball really well. Charles, the trailer, top of the key, long two, and he got it! Oh. You know, we hit shots, we shared the ball really well. Jimmer pulling up for those 15-footers, though. Here's a three. Jimmer got it! <laughs> Angle right, Jimmer for that. 
when Jimmer catches the ball, I mean, especially when you know he's on fire, you just kind of just get in that watching mode. Jimmer drives the lane, got past Gary, finger roll for the score. Oh, Jimmer pass. tracks it, Edmonton Jackson tracks it down, hands off to Fredette, Fredette lays it up and in. Guarded by Gary on the wing right side, crossover, three, got it again! Fredette fades away from 12, yes! I mean, what can you say? You run out of superlatives for Jimmer Fredette. I'm sitting by an official that's going to do, be doing the next game, uh, the, the nightcap game, and the official and I are talking to each other, and he's saying, I can't believe this. I've been refereeing games for 35 years, and I've never seen anything like this. Fredette down the lane, Fredette draws a bump, banks and scores! No call, but that's a record for Jimmer! There it is, 33. 33 and a half, a new BYU record. That's a State Farm drive of the game. Jimmer Fredette, 33. They were throwing, I mean, Fenton at him. He was a small, quick guy, whatever he is, 5'8", you know, but extremely fast. Score. Jimmer on the arc right side to the baseline, ducks in on Fenton again, shoots and scores again! They were throwing guys like Snell at him, who are like 6'6", extremely long, and then Darius Gary, who's kind of bulkier and has a little bulk, and they were trying to do this and that, and it was just kind of fun to, you know, see as kind of a mind game where you're going back and forth and seeing what they're going to do to stop him. Jackson steals, leaps to Fournette, Fournette, lays it up and in, 39 for Jimmer. I have never seen a scoring onslaught like that before, and that was incredible. Bucket after bucket after bucket, it was like, this can't keep going, it can't be going like this with Jimmer, and um, he just kept putting them in. Just to see someone that determined um, hit shots that you really shouldn't probably even be taking, uh, maybe on a video game, it might be okay. Jimmer stops middle of the lane, puts it up, and he scores it to go! He gets it to go! The record setter, the legend, Jimmer Fernandez! The way he ended it, hitting that, you know, the, the off-balance shot and then the free throw uh, to break not the single game record, but then the career record in the same kind of possession was, um, was just icing on the cake. Fenton rocks it and splits it, gets in the paint, lost it, a move on the steal, gives to Jimmer. Is he going to pull it out? He's going to drive it. Jimmer with the hoop, he scoops and scores! Jimmer 52! I was sitting next to Danny Ainge that night, and uh, Danny had a poker face, and he knew there were people watching him, but there was a point in that game where he said under his breath a couple times to me, Tom, this kid is unbelievable. The things that he can do, people can't do that. Cougars win it, 87 to 76. Lots of good shows to see here in Las Vegas, but nothing like the Jimmer Show. He scores 52, and BYU wins it by 11. 87 to 76, the Cougars are winners on Final Four Friday. BYU plays on Championship Saturday here in Las Vegas. San Diego State trying to avenge two tough losses, the only two all year. The only thing that's kept them from perfection, BYU. San Diego State trying to get avenge and trying to win its second straight Mountain West Conference Championship. Well, a game like this, a matchup like this, deserves a better finish than a blow. Fredette. So Jimmer Fredette will end up with 30. Aztecs are Mountain West Conference Tournament champions. With eight seconds to go, they can bounce it out, and they will. San Diego State wins the Mountain West. We had a hard time making shots, open shots, and uh, you know that that's what our team really depends on is um, you know being able to score in in space. Well, they're a very good team, and we realized that we knew we was going to be in for a battle, and they kind of got up on us early uh, and got a little surge in the beginning of the second half, and then we started to come back a little bit, just didn't have enough energy to to withstand it. This team has been all over the country, and found ways to win games, uh, competed extremely well in the fourth ranked team and RPI team in the country, uh, have a regular season co-championship, has 30 wins, has RPI in the top 10. So uh, I think that th these players have earned the right to uh, you know, play on. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our New York studios and the NCAA Basketball Championship Selection Show. I'm Greg Gumbel. There are several exciting differences about this year's tournament. Three extra teams, four first-round games, and the tournament will be covered on four networks, CBS, 
TBS, TNT, and True TV. And it all culminates in Houston with the national championship game on CBS for the 30th consecutive year. Just a short while ago, the tournament committee finished up this year's tournament brackets. We knew we were going to go. It was just a matter of where we were going against two and at what seed. You just don't know where you're going to get picked. You just hope that you get a good seed. You know, you're always wondering where are we going to go, who are we going to play, what's going to happen. And we were, you know, waiting for our name forever and ever. Second and third round games to be played Thursday and Saturday in Denver, Colorado, out of the Mountain West. The Cougars of BYU, they share the Mountain West regular season title with San Diego State. And Mountain West Player of the Year, Jimmer Fredette, who leads the nation in scoring. Who do they play? From the Southern Conference, the Terriers of Wofford, who won their second straight Southern Conference tournament title. They enter the tournament on an eight-game winning streak. It was a great feeling for us. We knew that we had a good seed and we could go in there and do some damage. We welcome all of you back to the beautiful city in the front range of the Rocky Mountains, Denver, Colorado, where this evening the 14th seeded Terriers of Wofford out of Spartanburg, South Carolina, take on the third seeded Cougars of BYU from Provo. The first round game, no matter where you play, no matter what tournament it is, whether it's the South Padre Invitational or the, um, you know, the, the conference tournament or the NCAA tournament, the first round game is always hard. Baseline feed knocked away from Dolan, out of bounds off of Woffer, BYU basketball. Every time you step on the floor with the guys, you know there's going to be someone that's going to take a role that's bigger than probably a role they've ever played with. and. In that game, you know, in, in that situation, it was uh, Logan Magnuson. Magnuson drive, draws the charge. They got to call that, and Logan stepped in. Never knew how much I was going to play. I never knew if it was going to be zero minutes or 20 minutes. Nice skip pass. pass, yeah. And they come outside this for three. Oh, he got it. Logan Magnuson, number 12. We, we get a little bit of a lead, and then they start to make a push back. High screen set by Magnuson, rolls off, and he's open for three. Logan takes it and makes it. Jimmer trusts in his teammate and threw the ball to me, and, and I knocked down a big three to extend the lead back up to five. Without that performance by Logan, uh, we could have won that game, but he certainly guaranteed that it was going to be no question that we're going to win that game. I'm really happy for Logan that he hit those shots in the Wofford game because he actually, those couple shots that gave us a little bit of a lead and let us breathe, got all the rest of the guys playing, we were able to finish that game out. Everyone's wondering, who's this Logan Magnuson? And just the guy that works hard. And he kept our bench together. He was what I kind of referred to him as kind of our bench captain, is he kept all those guys up to par and ready to play. And I knew he'd not only be important to have as a friend on the team, but someone essential for the key part of our uh, legacy here. Logan is a is a glue guy. That's what we call Logan in the in the in the room. You know, in the locker room, he we call him a glue guy. Does anything for our team to win. He is someone who will show you how you should play, with what passion you should play with, and that's something that's easy to follow. We wouldn't have gone where you know where we went without Logan and his big contributions. It by eight, 74, 66. You watch us play against Wofford, and then you watch Gonzaga play against St. John's. Um, and Gonzaga was terrific against St. John's. I think BYU was an underdog in that game against Gonzaga because of the fact that they kind of had an average performance against Wofford in the first round. So we've been here before. We've been here where no one thinks that our team has a chance and all our guys did was respond in the very best way they could, they possibly could. There were so many times in the last two seasons where they had to prove something. They had to, they had to prove they could win at Vegas. They had to prove that they could beat New Mexico. They had to prove that they could win an NCAA tournament game. And this game against Gonzaga was just the next thing that they had to prove to the world that they could do. It's been 30 years since BYU got out on the first weekend. Sacre. Left side of the lane, Jackson jumps out on the steal. It's two on one, now two on two. Bounce to Abuo, lays it up and in. I think a lot of those guys took that to heart, and especially Kyle. Kyle came out there and he just, he was a rebounding machine. Left junction to Gray, jumps it and missed it. Rebound, Collinsworth again. Kyle Collinsworth with six boards, they're all huge. Steve came in and knocked down some big shots for the Gonzaga game, and James played great defense when he came in. The rebound, he's blocked by Anderson! That game, I felt like it was BYU basketball again, a, a team that 
got us there, and that, that team that we were, you know, I felt like it came back. Jackson picks it off, Emery stole it, and the Cougars can reset it. Kimmer got a piece of that pass, allowed Jackson to get it, and that's steal number 100. There was no one out there who wasn't carrying their own weight, and we were able to go out and just smack those guys. We had guys that were 6'5 and 6'6 in the middle of the lane against their seven-footers. Abuo, Abuo drives right to the rim! We were still bodying them. We were, we were really going out there and battling with them, and we got the best of them, I think. To see them come out the way they did, I mean, that was it was an impressive display of just no mercy, really, for their opponent. Hands right wing, Noah, backbreaker, got it for three! Towards the end of the Gonzaga game, look at the scoreboard and be up by 20 points in the second round of the NCAA tournament when no one thought we'd win. That was awesome. And that's how the West Coast Conference rivalry starts now between BYU and Gonzaga with that game in Denver. Final score is going to be 89 to 67. Standing ovation for the BYU fans in Denver. We made it to the Sweet 16, and people hadn't seen it for a long time, and BYU fans were, were thirsty for that, and the whole team wanted it so badly that uh, it was destined. Jackson, angle right, shoots, and scores for three again. Jackson Emery makes it a one-point game. Not BYU on the steal, Jimmer in transition. Jimmer stops, hands off to Logan. Logan lays it up and in with the power. I really believe that these players gave it their all. They, they left everything out there. Jackson had you know thrown his body all over the floor like he always does. Jimmer was banged up. Takes point to the lane, kicks in the corner. Steve for the tie. Rogers for three. 30 30 the score. It's in. Jimmer changing speeds, gets low off the window, reverse it, score! It was this, you know, quintessential of this team. They, they, they left it out there. It was definitely hard for me to walk in that locker room and think that was the last time I'd be in a BYU uniform, but at least I walked off knowing that, you know, I gave it my all, that I played my hardest and you know, you leave no regrets on that floor, and that's all you can hope for as a player and as a team. And that's gonna do it. A Jimmer coming off the court uh, after the Florida loss in the waning seconds of the game. The game was sealed. It was a uh, time when I thought, oh, wow, what a year <laughs> that kid just had. You know, and it's just like too bad that it couldn't continue, but there were no regrets. From Brigham Young University, the NABC Division I Player of the Year, Jimmer Fredette. Sometimes you, when you see a guy night in and night out, you, you just think, gosh, am I really that biased? Is, is he, are there other people that see what I see? And I think it was nice for BYU fans to see the validation from the voters on, on just about every award that Jimmer was the guy that rose to the top. Yeah, well, I definitely wasn't expecting it. I wanted to be in the running and hopefully at least win one of them or something like that. But to win all of them was an unbelievable honor for me. It, it was an honor for our team, I think, because without them, you know, I wouldn't have been able to do it. They, it was a whole team effort um, to, to get these awards. But when all was said and done, of a really fun year of some special players, Jimmer was the one that kind of you'd say, not consensus, but um, overall was the, the, the player of the year. And it was so great to see that everybody else saw what we saw in Jimmer. With the 10th pick in the 2011 NBA draft, the Milwaukee Bucks select Jimmer Fredette from Brigham Young University. The Jimmer Fredette story is in chapter two right now. Who knows how many chapters there will be. Once you hear your name called, it's, uh, I don't even know how to describe the feeling. You're, you're, you're still nervous, you're, st you're really excited, you're, you're happy you know, that your family's there, and you, you know, you, it's, tons of emotions go into it because there's a lot of uncertainty. You don't know what's going on, really, and uh, you still have a ton of stuff ahead of you. The top scorer in the nation and maybe the most talked about player in this draft, Jay Billis. What's this kid like on a basketball court? Well, he's going to score. I mean, he's an extraordinary scorer. One thing about a great team is that you look back in hindsight's 2020. Take everything into consideration, what they accomplished, despite some of the adversity that they faced. I really think that this is the best team that ever competed. Every game was something new with the team or with somebody stepping up or with Jimmer going off for 30, 40, 50. He scoops and scores! 
The thing that stands out the most to me is um, the 32 wins. BYU is one of the best running teams in America. You know, I think we'll all look back at, at uh, this, this past uh, season of Jimmer and, uh, and always, you know, tell our family and friends, you know, boy, those were the days. It was a lifetime experience, and I'm glad I got to be a part of it. Made a, the best of the year and then had a great time. I like, I like what he was trying to do. This is what I'm talking about. When you're in it, you've just got to enjoy it. And I don't think I've seen anything like that uh, in, in BYU history. Yeah, I think the future is in great hands with Coach Rose. I hope these players that come in have that vision and that passion to continue to work hard and bring BYU basketball to that level. We're excited. We've got some really good players, some great talent coming in. We have the right coaches, we have the right players, and we have the right fans. Dave Rose, Sweet 16, Jimmer Fredette, Jackson Emery, and a host of incredible teammates that made for one very special year. Amazing season. It's amazing. It's amazing. It was amazing. That was unreal for all of us. This year it was unreal. It's unbelievable. It was magic.